Hello, and welcome to the show, to our show. We're so glad you joined us today. I'm Darlene Pickford. And I'm Greg Bauer, and we want to tell our viewers about a couple of upcoming shows that okay. we think you'll find really interesting. One on monarch butterflies, Ooh. part one and part two, two in the environment, and also one that's kind of a fun thing that we're looking forward to, kids and their pets. And Ooh. we're going to have some neat kids on talking about their pets and I think you'll really enjoy that one. So, but what's on tap for today, Darlene? Well, we're going to have a little more serious show today, okay. uh, Greg. We're going to talk about cancer in our pets. Oh my. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Please uh, introduce our guest. I'll be happy to. Um, our guest today is Dr. Rennie Church, who is a Paducah veterinarian and uh, very knowledgeable on this topic. And uh, Rennie, thank you so much for thank coming you. to uh, share some thoughts with us today. And give our viewers a real good idea of what they're dealing with possibly. My pleasure. Thanks so much for coming. Tell us before we get started on this topic about your fur family. Um, I have an aging dog. She's 14. She's oh. a border collie. I've had mm -hmm. her since she was a baby. Um, she was a little little throwaway. She's been the best thing Aww. ever. And then we have three cats that have all come home with me from the clinic for <laughs> one <laughs> various, reason various reasons. Yes. So um, have that two fish, two kids. That's Two. plenty oh, wow. <laughs> of all of them. <laughs> you are a busy person. <laughs> Some days. <clears throat> uh, cancer in pets is kind of a, a serious topic. For our viewers, educate us. What is a cancer? Um, a cancer is a cell line that has gone crazy. It just overgrows and it turns over cell after cell after cell and takes over a space. And cancer, the bad thing about cancer is that it will steal all of your nutrition, all of your oomph. It'll take whatever blood supply it needs. Doesn't matter what the rest of your body's doing. It's very, very selfish. Just takes everything it needs. Doesn't matter what else the body needs. So. Mm. Okay. And what, are there different types of cancer? I mean, yes. For, for okay. Um, cancers in pets are just like cancers in people. There's skin cancers. There's um, internal cancers. There's lymph cancers. There's any any cancer that a person can get. A dog or a cat can get in in general. So. Like um, cancer of the blood, leukemia. Mm -hmm. Yep, we see we see leukemias, we see lymphomas, we see um, splenic tumors, mangial sarcomas, uh, mast cell tumors, uh, the whole gamut. Yeah, are any types of cancer more common? Uh, the most common um, skin cancer we see in dogs is called a mast cell tumor. And it can be something to nothing. Um, it, you know, you've had spots, or right. people have had spots that are precancerous, you know, which it's, right. once it's gone, it's gone and you're all good versus, right. you know, melanomas on the right. skin. Um, in dogs, that would be the mast cell tumor. And um, it's graded according to uh, how many of these you have pop up at once. Is it invaded the lymph nodes? Um, where is it located? That's a big thing, the spot on the body where it's located. Right. Um, that's that's a, a common um, skin type cancer. Um, other cancers we see, you see a lot of lymphoma. Uh, right, lymph and what is a lymphoma? Lymphoma is cancer in the lymph nodes, and it usually manifests um, in, a, in a dog with large large submandibular nodes, and then as you go to palpate, all the nodes are enlarged How behind the knee. How about a cat? Knee. How does it? Um, a cat, same thing. It okay. usually pops up here first. The biggest, the most noticeable for owners, and it can be seemingly overnight. So um, lymphomas are big. Um, we see a lot, we see intestinal cancers. We see um, hemangial sarcomas, which are typically start on the spleen in an animal. It's a vascular cancer. Okay. So th those are probably the ones that I see most commonly. Bone cancers, see bone cancers in large dogs and mammary cancers. Those are those are the big ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, do are there certain ones that dog has cancers more than cats or are, are they about the same? I probably see more cancer in dogs and that may be just because, um, yeah, you know, people <laughs> tend to be, maybe a little more attentive to, yes. the, to the one dog. But, um, you know, as far as dogs versus cats, you see it in both, in both, so. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a sad fact that the dog gets more trips to the vet for yes. care than, than cats That's do. That's true, that is but true. Maybe in the future, <laughs> we cat lovers can change that. Yes, ma'am. And dog lovers also. <laughs> and uh, out of curiosity, I know we, we mentioned, we've mentioned in the past about allergies being more prevalent, say, in our local area here around Paducah. Uh -huh. Is cancer in a similar situation? I personally see more in our office than what is um, the norm. 
then what is the norm according to the textbooks? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that's, you know, just my understanding that's true in this area for people as well. A lot of cancer in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if it's the, I don't know why. A lot of cancer in this area. Yeah, so. I think there's a lot of cancers kind of everywhere. Yes. It, it could it be we're diagnosing it better now? Maybe. That's you know, probably I mean, a large, I guess a large we part of it. we just don't know. Yes, there's lots of advanced diagnostics that we have access to now in veterinary medicine that 10 years ago, maybe we didn't 10, 15 years ago. So perhaps, you know, it's I just mean, being, you know, we just don't We're really. seeing it more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, now that leaves, how do you die? I, I uh, well, first, I guess we should ask, what are the symptoms for just, you know, c the most general symptoms that I should be aware of that. Or that concerns. The concerns. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, a cachectic animal, which is where they, they lose weight off of their backbone. They look like they still got their little plump belly, but their backbone it, it tends to become prominent, you know, pretty quickly, like over, you know, a short period of time, week or two, even less sometimes. Um, that's a cachexia, and, and usually that's heart related or cancer related, one of the two. Um, just general malaise, or certainly if you see a lump or a bump, you know you want right. to get it. You want to get it checked. Um, they they generally stop eating. They just they just can't seem kind of you know mopey. Lethargic. Yeah, and they, they just mope so around, don't want to go. Yes, and it, it tends to it tends to in animals manifest quickly. You know, it's like I said, seemingly overnight sometimes. So the difference. Mm -hmm. so. How about vomiting or diarrhea? It depends on the type of cancer. Oh, but okay. yes, certainly with intestinal cancers or stomach cancers, you can see vomiting, large bowel cancers, diarrhea, definitely. Yeah. And I think, you know, weight loss would probably be a mm -hmm. very good indicator. Quick that, weight loss. Quick weight loss. Quick weight loss. Like Paul, I know in cats, you know, you can use a baby scale mm -hmm. uh, to get the weight of a cat because if you've got a, a say a six pound cat, you know, uh, a pound is extremely that's huge. significant. That's huge. That's a lot of percent yeah, yeah. loss. So particularly in a small cat or even a small dog, I think you should really monitor that, you know, if you, you know, if you want to really, really monitor this situation, you should keep an eye on their weight. Yes, so, yes. yes. Yeah. It, I learned that the hard way. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> is, does cancer seem to be more prevalent in animals that spend all their time outdoors as opposed to indoor uh, animals? I don't, I can't say that I've really seen a difference in the mm -hmm. two. I, I can't okay. associate the prevalence of cancer with indoor versus outdoor. Okay. How about age? Age, it depends on the type of cancer. You know, some cancers are more prominent in older, older like animals. Could you give us some? Um, memory cancers. Breast usually, cancers? Yeah, I usually see those um, after, uh, you know, in an aged pet. Um, each heat cycle increases the risk of memory cancer by a huge amount. The first heat cycle can increase the risk of memory cancer by 60 to 80 percent in one animal. Hmm. So each heat cycle, the influence of estrogen is going to um, make you more susceptible or more likely to get a memory cancer. Hmm. Memory cancer in cats, 99.9 .9 percent of all memory cancer, memory tumors in cats are cancerous. They're adenocarcinoma and they're Ooh. related to estrogen. Uh, about 50 percent in dogs. You know, you have a, a, a mass come up on the on the in the breast line of a dog and it's a 50 50 shot in cats it's likely going to be cancer and it's usually quick and aggressive in cats so you want to get on it mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what it says is that uh, you really need to spay or neuter your animals before just another that heat reason cycle. to do so and do yes. it and do it the, do yeah. it the earlier the more effective it is mm -hmm. usually you know six months or so before really? they come into heat mm -hmm. and that will help also with the overpopulation too. yes sir <laughs> oh yes <Low> cost. <laughs> <laughs> a good low-cost spay-neuter program would help improve a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, weight loss, lethargic, vo uh, maybe vomiting, diarrhea, but any any real change in what's normal. Mm -hmm. So again, it, 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 we as pet owner owners or pet parents need to observe our cats mm -hmm. and our dogs mm -hmm. and pay attention to them. Yes, ma'am. I, I know it's so easy sometimes you get so busy, you know, uh -huh. you just you just pet them and go, you don't really observe mm -hmm. like, like like we should sometimes. Well, and many times they're not as demanding either. Right. Oh, no. Uh, that, so th that's they, a very you tend to pass good, them over. Right. That is a very, <laughs> very good point. Yes, ab absolutely so. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, I have the sim symptoms. What kind of treatments, what, or what, how, do you, uh, how do you diagnose it? Once you think there's something, how do you verify a cancer? Um, well, 
if it's a lump or a bump, you can do a fine needle aspirate. You just tap it with a needle and then look at those cells under the microscope and see if anything looks scary or not. That's and you do that right in the office? Yes, okay. yeah, just right there in the office. And um, you know, sometimes if, if it's questionable, we'll send it off to the pathologist at the lab, um, but, but we start with a fine needle aspirate. Um, if it's something that um, you know, seems scary then we, and we can do surgery, then we remove it, send it off, and get the final diagnosis from a pathologist on, on what kind of cancer it is or if it's even cancer. Um, another way to diagnose is x-ray. You, know, you, you, you feel something in the belly, you take an x-ray, you see it in the belly. Not all cancers are um, just big lumpy masses, though. You can have <laughs> cancer in the bowel in the lining of the bowel. So you're talking about a tubular structure, and it's in the lining of that right. bowel, so you're not going to feel just a, you know, a big lump in the belly. Ultrasound is great for that. And what is ultrasound? Um, ultrasound is the same, same as us. You have a probe, and you, you can go in, and the waves bounce off of, of what you see on the inside, and it outlines. And so um, you can see, actually, the lining of the bowel. You can see you're looking at the structure across the monitor and then you can see like a change in the architecture. And this is a non-invasive. Right, it's, yeah, right. it's just like, yeah. A, a regular ultrasound. Just like a human. regular ultrasound for humans, that's okay. right. And so um, you can use ultrasound, x-ray, and then you can do more advanced diagno diagnostics. We can send for a CT or an MRI, say we're concerned about a lesion on the brain. You can send for a CT of the brain and, and you know, get your diagnosis that way. So. It, it, essentially, it's the same set of procedures it that is. we would use for humans. Oh, it is. Yeah. You always do blood work, too, because that can mm -hmm. give you a clue. If, if, say, you see something in the abdomen on an x-ray, but you're not sure, is this off the liver or the spleen, sometimes blood work can help pinpoint that. Um, a lot of animals with cancer can have normal blood work except for their CBC, which is a complete blood count. It's a differential in red, red count and white count. If your red cell count is low, you're anemic. That's a, that is a lot of times happens with cancers because the cancer is stealing what you need, your blood supply that you need. So um, anemia is a big one that we see on blood panel with cancer. So well, what if the blood work came back normal? But yet? it still doesn't mean there's not a cancer. That's right. That's right. Because <laughs> cancer doesn't always say if you have a cancer on the liver, it doesn't always interfere with the liver's function or with what you see on blood work, even though it's destroying the liver by Same. eating away at the surface of it, your st liver is still functioning like right. it should, so everything looks okay on blood work. So, And I would think it also would depend on the stage, how far along the cancer is sure, developed. Too. Sure, and unfortunately, in the veterinary world, you're usually pretty advanced by the time you're, you're diagnosed because dogs don't complain. Yeah, and mm -hmm. cats don't and they don't. And cats don't complain, and you know, it may have been growing for a while, but then the owner notices, hey, you know, she's lost weight over the last you know, seemingly few days, mm -hmm. and right. <laughs> yeah, and so, and if you think about it, the things that happen in five to seven years in a person's life happens yes. in one year yeah. in a dog or a cat. So if you think about someone that's been diagnosed with a cancer, where they're at seven years later is where you're going to be at within a year yes. on an animal. So everything is so sped up. You know, people want to say, oh, it was just so aggressive. Not so much aggressive, it's just very sped up. In because an animal. of their difference in life. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Of the changes that occur in an animal in a year versus a year in a person, it's yeah. a huge difference. So. Well, we're getting a real good start oh, yes, on are. our knowledge of cancers, and uh, but we want to take time out now to uh, tell our viewers that we are dedicating the show today uh, about pet cancers to Skeeter. It was a little cat that uh, Darlene and I had, and we lost her this past year. Uh, she was of years of 2002 to 2014. And so this is a little story about Skeeter and, and our show dedication to her, so give a listen. Skeeter was a domestic, short hair, female cat who lived with Darlene and Greg for over 12 years. Darlene had been doing some work at the Project Hope Rescue Shelter and Skeeter kept telling her that she wanted a forever home. So Darlene relented and brought her home to live with their other cats. Skeeter quickly fit into the other group of cats and adapted very well to her new buddies. A small cat, Skeeter never bothered a soul, but you knew that she was always there. She never demanded much, but during the past several months of 2014, Skeeter began to lose a significant amount of weight and the vet discovered that she had a sizable mass in her intestine. He only gave her a little time to live, so Darlene and Greg made the decision to put her down. It was a great loss, and Skeeter will always be remembered for her friendliness and enthusiasm. She will never be forgotten. 
We hope you, uh, well, enjoy is not might be the proper <laughs> word, but uh, uh, the, the little story about Skeeter. She was one of our favorites. and uh, um, She's we, sorely missed. Yes, she is. If our viewers would like more information, we'd like to refer you to some websites. <clears throat> First of all, the uh, ASPCA, ASPCA, <laughs> got it. <laughs> the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It's almost easier to remember it that way than the acronym. <laughs> and Auburn University has a good a lot of information uh, in the website under the College of uh, Veterinary Medicine and the same with Purdue University. Uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. Both of those two schools are very well known uh, academically and our, our guest today is a graduate of Auburn and so <laughs> she can tell us good things about that but uh, if you'd like more information that's a place to get it. So we're we're, just a minute, we're visiting today with me. Dr. Rennie Church in case our viewers have just tuned in uh, who is a Paducah veterinarian and we're talking about the topic of pet cancers and particularly in cats and dogs. So. And if you'd like a heartfelt story about a cancer survivor, a special dog named Splash the Wonder Dog, and that's the wonder because he was a therapy dog who did survive cancer, you can go to the website and see that show. It's one of our past shows. Just go to wwwpaduka 2 that's the number two, dot org slash video clips slash animals and it's a very heartwarming story yes. about what a couple went through to save their beloved dog and it, it is one of the success stories yes. and it will warm your heart. Yes. So, okay. shall we return? Greg? I think we shall. <laughs> um, in the diagnostic procedures, tell me what a barium x-ray is in a cat. In a cat? Mm -hmm. um, barium can go uh, one of two ways. You can do a barium swallow or you can do a barium enema. Okay. And basically it's a thick white um, uh, dye, okay. of sort of. Um, it, it goes in and it highlights what it touches. And so we use it to, um, to study the lining of the bowel to see if, say, it, say it's in the colon, it's going here, and then it has a disruption, then right. you know that there's something there because you should just see a solid line of barium, a bright white line on x-ray. Okay. And so if you have a deviation or a defect or um, an outline, then you know that you've got something there. It's just a non-invasive way to see if there's anything there that needs mm -hmm. to be further investigated. <clears throat> well, but and then the, the cat can't have food before the procedure or anything like that. Right, because you don't want to get hooked up on food, food and right, think right. that, oh, what's that? So. And I guess it's the same for a dog. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, but anyway, it's just another tool mm -hmm. that you would use to diagnose mm -hmm. a potential mm -hmm. cancer. In the intestines, usually. Yeah, yeah usually. Yeah. Uh, for intestinal, right, yeah. yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. stomach and intestine. Okay, now uh, let's move on to treatment. Let's suppose we've got a diagnosis. Okay. What kind of treatment and I know it probably, it varies by It the, does. But what kind of general treatments would be available for a pet that has cancer? First and foremost, if it can be resected surgically, that's what you want to do. Um, if, you know, if it's, if it's something that um, you think that you can uh, remove the whole cancer, that's right. wonderful. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes all you can do is debulk, which is just clean it out as much as you can for the comfort of the animal. Mm. So okay. their surgery. Um, there are uh, chemotherapy protocols, really? especially for lymphoma. Um, yes, chemotherapy in dogs, you know, people are kind of like, oh, chemotherapy. And, and, and I won't say that we do just a whole lot of it, but one of the cancers that is highly amenable to chemotherapy treatment is lymphoma. And I'm talking like a 24-hour remission. So, really? Yes. So there are protocols for, uh, for chemotherapy protocols for lymphoma. And basically, um, the one that I use, they would come in weekly for four weeks for IV treatment, and then uh, you come in every three weeks. And um, dogs, the good thing about dogs, especially um, with chemotherapy, is they don't, their hair doesn't fall out. <laughs> they don't tend to get nauseous. Ah. Um, if you get a problem, usually it's about day four, and the white cell count falls, so they, they can get sick on top of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always tell owners, really watch about day four, and if you're not feeling well, come back in, let's get a CBC and just make sure we're doing okay because you might need an antibiotic, you know, just to make sure if you're getting sick. So um, that in cats, it's a little more difficult because most cats don't appreciate an IV catheter, no. you know. <laughs> so um, some cats, you end up having to actually anesthetize them to put the IV catheter in. 
And, and cats are, are delicate. I mean, they're, they're pretty delicate. There's some chemotherapy agents you can't use on cats that you can readily use on dogs. Oh, really? So you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, it has been done. We, we've done it. Um, but probably way more common in dogs. And the most common cancer that we treat with chemotherapy protocols is lymphoma. Because it does, um, a remission is attainable quickly. And, and if not for just buying some time so the animal feels better because these lymph nodes yes. will physically go down. I mean, quickly, you know, quick remission. So there's chemotherapy protocols. Um, and there are radiation protocols. You have to go to university for that. And typically oh. that's nine to 12 weeks. The dog stays there or cat stays there. And it's oh. a pinpoint radiation. Um, it's two to three times a week, depending on the type of cancer. Um, and they are under anesthesia each time, uh -huh. usually an injectable anesthesia called Propaflow. Um, and then they're tubed and put on, just like us, they're monitored wow. and, and, and um, they use isofluorine or sevoflurane. And it's a pinpoint radiation, it's quick. Yeah, but they do stay there, um, and, and they are monitored all the time mm -hmm. um, for that full 9 to 12 week mm -hmm. uh, series. So, so you've got surgery, radiation, chemo, and then there are um, uh, chemotherapies that are oral as well that you can send home you know, to use for, for, depends on what you're treating. But now, yeah. We've mentioned several different types of cancer. Mm -hmm. Is there one type that is maybe more prevalent in cats and dogs than uh, others? I think I see lymphoma the most. Hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, lymphoma. And then a lot of splenic tumors, mangiosarcomas, as far as, you know, inside the abdomen. So, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, they're just like us, tons, yep. tons of cancers, different ones. But those are probably the two most common that I see. Okay. In, in your career, have you seen a change just from your experience over time with the cancers or? A change in, in the in, in 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 the type or the treatments or the, the no, prevalence I, of them. I think it's been pretty steady. Been pretty yeah, steady. Yeah, I think I I can't say that there's been any real change in the last 14 years on you know the types that I've seen or the prevalence. They they pretty much are what they are. And so okay. And and let me ask you, in, in, have there been any new recent developments in cancer for pets? say in the last 15 years that you're aware of? You mean or treatments? Been, or, treatments? Well, treatments, drugs, diagnostic yes. procedures. There's, all, there's always something new coming really? down the pipe, always. Oncology is a huge discipline in veterinary medicine, huge discipline. Is it? Yes, there are um, lots of oncologists, veterinary oncologists. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's a huge, huge discipline. So there's always something new coming out. And it's based a lot on human human findings too. Oh really? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a, I think one of the, I was just reading the other day, um, we use paroxicam, which is just a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which is the class of drugs that aspirin fits in, or uh, ibuprofen, so okay. non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, it's called paroxicam, and it's always been used um, as a treatment modality for transitional cell carcinoma, which is a cancer of the bladder. It has anti-tumor activities that we just found out by the way, it has anti-tumor activities, uh, anti-tumor activity. So um, they applied that, they started looking at similar cancers in other places, and it seems to have um, a, a nice effect with uh, melanoma in the mouth and with um, squamous cell carcinoma. So I just recently had a patient come in that had a melanoma way on the back of the tongue, and I removed it, and I said, you know, really, I, I can't take the whole tongue. You know, right, to, right. In order to, mm -hmm. to, to <clears throat> promise, not promise them, but to tell them that this is not gonna come back, I gotta take the whole tongue. Can't do that. So I, I took as much as I could, so the animal's completely comfortable after surgery. And then I said, let's try paroxicam because it, it's just coming down, coming right. down the pipe that this, this is new working, just like it does on TCC and on uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And she's doing great. So. Uh, Go, has gone further than what I expected without regrowth. Wow. So, you know, whether or not, I mean, I have to attribute it to the paroxicam because, mm -hmm. and it's just been a great success story so far. So, so far. Okay. Well, educate me. What is a melanoma? What type of cancer is that? Um, a, a melanin is um, pigment and it, it oh, grows okay. from those pigment cells. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And people oh. get melanomas, I think, of skin. Skin like, melanoma. Yeah, dogs, it's usually in the mouth or between the toes. It's very specific oh, on the places the where you worry about melanoma. And uh, in dogs, it's on the toes and on the tongue. Okay. And cats in cats in the mouth, too. Yes. Cats, it's in the mm -hmm. mouth. In the mouth as well. And does it look, is it a different color? Um, most, most melanomas are black. They, because melanin is the pigment. You I got gotcha. you. Yeah, you can have atyp atypical non-pigmented melanomas, which are arise from the pink part of the gums, and they still look pink. And those are a little tricky because you can't just look at it and say, oh yeah, that's probably melanoma, versus if you've got, you know, the large black 
type mm -hmm. um, growth. So mm -hmm. there, it can be non-pigmented non-pigment, atypical melanoma, but for the most part, it it's, arises from the pigment cells in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. So any other new developments that you've seen in, in, in your career? Um, just that people, I think, are more likely to seek um, different treatment modalities, maybe than when I first started. Yeah, they're much, people are much more willing to listen to their options and to maybe explore those options than before, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's very important to, you know, don't jump to conclusion, ask what your options are. Sure. What are the mm -hmm. treatments? Is there another, mm -hmm. is there another way we can get more information? Sure, and you know? we always try to approach it very practically because Admittedly, there are yeah. things that we can do that we shouldn't do, you know, selfish things sometimes, you yes. know, it's our mm -hmm. animals. So, um, you know, we have to look at it practically. And, and, and some of those treatment modalities can be very expensive too. You know, yes. a 12 week stay at a university hospital for radiation I was therapy, like, it must be expensive. Thousands, thousands, <laughs> thousands. Mm. So, you know, y y there's a lot of things to consider with your pets, mm -hmm. so. Mm. Well, let, let's suppose that we found that our cat, had, our dog has an incurable um, cancer. Mm -hmm. What can we do to make it more comfortable? Pain control. Okay. I mean, the pain control is essential with cancer. Um, we use tramadol, which is uh, used for cancer pain, chronic cancer pain in people. Okay. Um, we can use tramadol. We can use um, uh, narcotics for yeah. pain control. Um, you know, we just encourage folks that if you're having to do that all the time and you're having more bad days than good, you know, you probably need to consider really right. where are we at and yes. what do we need to do at this point. Mm -hmm. but, but pain control, that's gotcha. know, the main yeah. thing. Well, let, I, I just hope their viewers don't ever have to go through that. But as, as pet owners, we just have to be very observant mm -hmm. of our animals and have good communication with our veterinarians yes, and ask for the many yeah. options. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're coming to time. I know, time, time passes so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and we have just gotten a wonderful education about uh, cancer yes. and pets uh, from you, uh, Rennie, today. And we want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy sure. schedule to thank you for having me. Pass thank the you information for coming. And, yes, uh, ma'am. And uh, so, and hopefully, all of our viewers will never have that problem. Absolutely, yeah. we but, hope they don't. But we can tell you from experience, it can happen. It can happen. So. In closing, I'm Darlene. I'm Greg, and we'd like to tell our viewers again what we tell you every time. Give your pet a little extra love today and every day. And a trip to the vet when needed. Exactly. exactly. See you next time. Bye.